Meet Brendan and his partner Andrew. I'd have all these sort of minor but rather peculiar things happening to me. My left leg might seize up a bit. My left arm would still sort of stop working. Like some 80,000 other Australians, Brendan has Parkinson's. I find that I need to be quite careful out uh, in the street because it's, it's very difficult to keep in a straight line. Other people really don't see that you have any kind of mobility problems, so I have to try and like, plot a course. Ever since Parkinson's was first described as a degenerative disorder, neurologists have wanted to know what's actually going on inside the brains of people with the condition. Well now, thanks to modern technology, they can look deep into the brains of people with Parkinson's. The Brain and Mind Institute, part of Sydney University, is home to Dr Simon Lewis. Unravelling the deep mysteries of Parkinson's has become the focus of Simon's research. People often think of it as an old person's disease. Well, about one in 20 cases, that's 5% of all cases, are under the age of 40 when they're diagnosed. So I've got three women who've all got children going to school who are in their 30s. Of particular interest to Simon is a phenomenon called freeze of gait. Oh, stuck again. <laughs> what we're talking about with freezing of gait is that for no obvious reason, patients feel as though their feet have been glued to the floor abruptly, often provoked by starting movement or turning, and then some other environments like narrow doorways or if they have to do a couple of things, dual tasking, and that will provoke it. It affects at least half of all patients with advanced disease. When did you first start getting symptoms? Would have been about 10 years. Simon realised that freeze of gait, or FOG, might be triggered in a way that could allow him to actually see what was going on inside a living brain. So he recruited people with Parkinson's, such as Brendan, as part of a wide-ranging investigation. Over my foot. Get it, come on, you got it. <laughs> Good man, OK. OK, walking over the lines, big high steps. Another volunteer for the study was Frank. I could get up here and walk around this room all right now. And then, and then when everyone was going home or something like that, going home, I'd fall over. And I don't realise I'm going to fall. Just this uh, stranger feeling comes over, I start to do a bit of a shudder. Or there's uh, the part that makes me go real fast. I always want to run. All the subjects were put through a standard set of tests to determine just how far their Parkinson's had progressed and how much it impaired their daily lives. And Simon had an idea of what was going on inside the mind when a freeze of gait occurs. There are a number of things that we know about Parkinson's. We know that the primary problem in Parkinson's is the lack of this chemical transmitter in the brain, dopamine. And we know that people who freeze seem to be more prone to freezing when their dopamine levels come down, so when their medications are wearing off. So that raises the question, well, dopamine must be integral to this process. The masterstroke of Simon's investigation was to get the subjects to experience a walking freeze while laying still inside a functional magnetic resonance imaging scanner. And I had this crazy idea that perhaps if we could recreate some of those things in a virtual environment uh, that would provoke freezing for patients in the real world, maybe we could provoke freezing, you know, using a virtual 3D environment. Hi, Brendan. We want to see you do a little bit more walking for us now. OK. OK. Off you go. Participants walk by using a pair of foot sensors while watching a graphic of a corridor adapted from a computer game. I had a little freeze there. The resulting images show what areas of the brain are active during the process of walking, even though Brendan has remained inside the fMRI. Good man. So this is the um, walking pattern um, whilst 
on his medication. So at this point, he doesn't freeze, he's walking smoothly. And to my untrained eye, it doesn't look like there's a lot of activity going on there. Ideally, it should just light up uh, those parts of the brain which do walking. And here, we see this very strong blob, and this is in the, what we call the motor cortex, the part that does the walking. But then look at Brendan's brain when he's walking inside the MRI without his medication. Wow. You can see that what he's had to do here just to overcome all that freezing, because when he's on his medications, he didn't have any of the freezing episodes. So it's an this, overloaded brain. It's isn't an it? overloaded yeah. brain, and it's really trying. So you can see there. And now we've got it starting in the cerebellum. Behind these brain images, there's an enormous amount of data that needs to be processed. The computer grunt side of the project was handled by Professor Phil Ward. Here we're, we're really trying to focus down on individual um, segments of time where the, where the patients are doing a particular task for a defined period of time. The patients walk at very different rates and the freezing events occur at random. This study is still in its preliminary stages and only a handful of Parkinson's patients have been fully scanned. Just terrible struggle getting mm. through that doorway. It's just uh, really sticking and uh, you can see that he's, uh, he's having a great deal of, deal of effort here. And now it's my turn. It's not that I'm showing any signs of Parkinson's, but the data from scanning my head will be included in the study as part of the control group. There he's got the cue to walk, and immediately you can see the difference in the speed. Mm -hmm. and Much faster. It's uh, almost like he doesn't have any trouble with his walking. That's right. His rhythm's very good as well, isn't it? Feels a little claustrophobic in here, but it's just like playing a computer game. It's you know, just that I'm doing it with my feet. It takes 40 minutes of having my head read to complete the tasks required. And it takes a solid day of number crunching to get my results. It's one thing being able to generate these amazing images of the human brain actually at work in people with Parkinson's. But can these images be translated into new therapies that will actually help them? I think that we're going to make some major breakthroughs but I really don't think it's going to be with some of the technology we have right now. But for now, Brendan and Frank will have to learn to live with Parkinson's. I always thought that I could get to a stage of life where I'd be able to control it. But I'd know when it was coming and sit down and do something else. That's the trouble is I don't know when it's going to come. Early on, once, uh, once I, I had the diagnosis confirmed, I, I made the decision that I was not going to try and let it rule my life uh, too much.